Hi, hey, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Beata Turoneva. I'm um, from Martin Beck Group Lab um, in uh, Germany from, um, and I will present today together with my uh, colleague Mateusz Sikora the structure of uh, the um, S protein of SARS-CoV-2. So we go directly from the patients on the nanoscale here, I would say. Um, so we use cryolactin tomography to study the structure. And I would first like to spare a few seconds uh, to explain why this is a good uh, technique or interesting technique to study SARS-CoV-2. So um, this is a general model of a coronavirus that actually came in a review already in 2019, regardless of the uh, COVID crisis. And um, this uh, describes the main proteins that um, forms the, the typical coronavirus. So you can see that there is a S protein, there are some envelope proteins, membrane proteins, and of course, uh, nucleocapsids with packed uh, RNA. And um, obviously, the more we know about the structure of these proteins, the better chances we have to actually fight the virus. So um, when the pandemic started, all of uh, people that could, they tried to study the S protein mainly because this is the most um, interesting uh, protein from the, point of, uh, from the point of infection, because this is the one that attacks the cells. And um, a lot of labs managed to actually uh, get a resolution, uh, structure at high resolution of this, uh, using a technique called single particle analysis, which is a technique, uh, method um, of a cryo-electron microscopy. But this method managed to reveal only the head of the spike. So, um, from the principle of how it works, it's not possible to resolve uh, more than just a small pieces. So in this case, this was the S protein, um, the upper part, but the rest of the virus remain unknown. And um, one way, or basically one of the only ways to study is that is actually to use cryo-electron tomography because this actually allows us not to focus only on the small part, but really display the wall uh, variants, including the spikes as they are and um, uh, before I go into what we learned when we start doing this, I would like to give you a brief introduction of what I think is a electron tomography. So for me, this is not um, only microscopic technique. This is the wall workflow that starts with a sample prep. And then we go for, for image acquisition using cryo-electron microscope. Uh, then we have to use some computational methods to reconstruct our, our data, and then we can finally analyze it. So the sample preparation is the first and the most important step uh, in this workflow. And this was done by um, our colleague Christoph Schurman from Paul Ehrlich Institute in Germany. Here he is working uh, on a virus. And um, there are, of course, a lot of technical details about the sample, but I think the most important um, details are that we got the sample, we actually got the sample that comes from a patient. So we, got, we were lucky enough to get a patient isolate. Uh, then we used the uh, Vero E6 cells to actually uh, propagate the virus and to get a more, more variants, more vi uh, virus particles. We, in total, we used five passages, um, which uh, left us with uh, viruses that had inactivated uh, furin cleavage site. And um, to make sure that the virus is the virus is really deactivated and no longer dangerous, so we can work with it, uh, we also fixed it with four percent paraformaldehyde. Once all of this were done, we had to prepare the sample for cryo tomography, which um, was done by uh, Sonia Welsh. And um, the most important step of this uh, procedure is actually um, freezing at a rapid speed that leaves the sample uh, frozen at minus 180 degrees Celsius. And once we have such a sample, we can put it into the electron microscope. Uh, so if this is our sample, we put it in there, uh, it's kept under this mi minus 180 degrees Celsius. We run electron beam through it and obtain an image, image that is basically a 2D projection of the electron density potential of our sample. But with, from the 2D image, we would not be able to get a 3D model, obviously. So we have to tilt the sample a bit and again, run electron beam through it to obtain a second image. And then we tilt again and obtain a third, a third image and so forth so, uh, so on and until we get the wall a series of images spanning typically from plus minus 60 de uh, degrees. So we have the wall image series that we call tilt series uh, that 
this that describes the 2D properties of our sample uh, from different angles. In, uh, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, we had uh, 41 images in each tail series, spanning from minus, uh, plus minus 60 degrees, and the uh, field between the, each image was uh, three degrees. We managed to um, obtain 300 tail series like that. And here is the, how it looks like. So this, this goes from minus 60 to plus 60 degrees, and you can see here the variance, and you can also see the uh, hints of, us, of the spikes here already. So once we have this, we can use computational techniques to actually reconstruct the 3D model of our, um, of our sample. And this 3D model is then called tomogram. So out of this 300 tilt series, we have to sort a bit to, get, to have only the good ones. We ended up with 266 tomograms reconstructed. And in total, these contain 1,096 1, uh, variants that we could then um, analyze. So here I show you the tomogram, uh, slicing through it, um, you can see the virons, you can see the spikes, you can see the insides, it's very nice. And slicing through all the way. Yes. So if we now look at the stills, um, you can see that it has all what you can uh, already see in the um, model before. So it has uh, the double leaf membrane. We can even see a bit of the M protein, or we believe that this is M protein. We can see the nucleocapsid inside. And of course, the most important, we see the spikes. Um, so um, we also started with the spike analysis as this was the most um, urgent one we believed. And, and we found out that on average, there are like 40 uh, S proteins or spikes per one virion, and they are randomly distributed. So they do not uh, tend to cluster, they do not, uh, but they are also do not uh, form any regular pattern. And if you look more closely, already from the other techniques were known that they can exist in a pre-fusion and post-fusion state. And this uh, large glo globular domain suggests that most of our spikes are actually in pre-fusion state. And the most striking thing we learned, because we had a very good quality of the data, was that they are flexible. So usually people assume them to be really straight as the needles sticking out from the virus, but we actually can see all kind of bending in those. And that was really surprising. So um, we uh, decided to study it more because um, this is all the information you can get if you have the uh, tomograms, but we can also try to get the more high resolution structure of, uh, of the spikes if you use something called subtomogram averaging. And it works more or less um, in a following way. If we have uh, some structures that are repetitive and remandant in the same conformation in our tomograms, we can cut them out in a boxes that we call subtomograms, and we can try to average them together to increase the signal uh, to noise and also the, the, the resolution. So basically in the first round, we take them as they are and just average them, we get some kind of plot, but then uh, we search in the angular space for different orientations and try to find the orientation that will improve our structure. And we do it as long as our structure improves until it's no longer improving and then we actually obtain a structure with high resolution. So if we now go for a um, for, um, map of the globular domain, so this is the electron density map, we see that we actually we succeeded and we uh, obtained um, structure at sub nanometer resolution um, around uh, eight angstroms. You can see the alpha helices that are there. This is the side view and from the top view you can also see how nicely, how nice they are. If you then use the um, isosurface modeling to look at this in a more 3D way, we can also see that we have nice uh, details here. We have the helices, we have the helices inside, we have the structures and the models that were known from the other studies actually fit. And if we play some more computational tricks, we can even uh, go further with the resolution and obtain as high details as five angstrom, so half of the nanometer. So again, you can see the helices here and you can see some loops that are not so not so common. So this was very interesting to, to see that the data actually are um, so good that we can go that high because this is not common uh, in uh, cryoton tomography. You can already go for high resolution, but as high, it's still not a commonplace. 
and uh, more or less we find, we, we find out that we actually not have one confirmation of the of the global spike, spike domain but we have two so-called opened and closed so these places here are receptor binding domains that actually uh, are responsible for connecting to ace2 receptors on the cells and they are actually responsible for attacking the cells and this closed state they are all free down and then uh, there is a um, open state where one of the monomers um, actually have the, the domain a bit more up, it's more better visible from the side view where you can again clearly see that this is closed one, it's down, but this is opening here, making this here less dense and sticking out. So this, uh, this open conformation is um, not so abundant. We had only 4,000 particles with conformations like that. And uh, while we had more than 8,000 with closed one and the reason for that uh, is that um, in that open state, the global domain can attack the cell. So it's more, it's good for her, uh, for the virus to be actually open, but at the same time, it's more, the virus is more vulnerable and it's e more easy to attack it. Because in the closed state, it's packed with sugars, which make it hard to actually, for the antibodies to connect somewhere. So we believe that the reason why it's actually closed most of the time is to protect uh, itself from being easily to be attacked. So these structures were known from, um, were already known to a certain degree from the other uh, techniques. Um, the one I mentioned, a single particle, actually resolved both of these conformations. But due to the harsh sample preps, uh, that uh, basically these structures correspond to the in vitro recombinants and now people uh, or one never knows if it actually in reality in situ when we just look would look at the virus if it would really be the same so this uh, our study confirms that is actually um, very uh, very uh, that it's consistent with the in vitro recombinants which um, makes it easier to develop the drugs to a certain degree um, but what we were also interested in was the part that was never uh, resolved before and it was the lag part. This, however, due to the high flexibility, um, kind of uh, pro uh, the flexibility of the lag um, resulted in the problem because um, the subtomogram averaging relies on the, on, the, on the parts being not flexible and the high flexibility means that the flexible parts are averaged out and not visible. So we decided to um, split our spikes uh, based on their distance to double membrane in a hole that we can actually resolve also the stock. And you can see that in some cases like here or here it looks like the spike is directly sitting on the membrane but when we did the subtomogram averaging and aligned it on the membrane we really see, we could see that they are at a different distance but the lag is never resolved even in the cases where they are completely or looks like they are completely straight and not bending and we realized that the only um, way how we can actually resolve the structure in a bit higher resolution also of the stock is to go per partes to try different uh, to, to try averaging the different parts of it separately and uh, for that we kind of needed to know how to split the stock and there uh, we teamed up with a group of Gerhard Hummer um, because they actually made some simulations of how the stock might look like that would actually explain this weird behavior for us. And um, from that moment, from here on, Mateusz will take over and tell you more about how to solve this problem. All right, so I hope you can see my screen. Hi everybody. So. Um, Actually, I would like to also start with the uh, with emphasizing that this was a, a convergent uh, collaboration, which started, I think, when when Beata started uh, looking at the samples. We already were thinking about building the the model of the uh, spike protein, because uh, there has been some structures already uh, before coming from the uh, single particle data, and uh, we wanted to uh, build a model which would uh, which would uh, encompass those structures and, and try to extend it and to try to understand uh, what the spike looks like. We started from the uh, pr protein data bank structure, which was missing some groups, which we then added. And then uh, we knew that there should be a lag uh, comparing with other coronaviruses, other, other spike proteins. 
Uh, and from the sequence analysis, it was clear that it should be uh, helices. We run by informatic predictions and we learned that uh, the most likely structure was a coiled coil, so which, which means that the three helices would be wrapped around each, each other. The caveat was here that the, 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 there were gaps between those. So there was a gap between the spike proper and the, the first uh, uh, coiled coil and then the second coiled coil. So we modeled them li like that. And also there is a transmembrane domain which has not been resolved. There are some ideas what it can look like based on the HIV as a, a protein. So we modeled the, the, the transmembrane uh, domain as a, this kind of a tripod. We added the C-terminal parts and we assembled this, this together by connecting the uh, pieces uh, by, by the flexible linkers. And then uh, spike protein is uh, heavily uh, modified uh, post translationally, uh, which uh, consists of uh, sugars which are attached to the surface of the protein, uh, so called glycans. And this is quite ex extensively decorated and is thought to prevent the human immune system uh, from interacting with the spike protein. So we added the, the glycans on the surface of the, of the protein. Uh, there was some mass spectroscopy data before, so we could sort of follow what kind of glycans should be added where. And there is also uh, a, a polymethylation, which is addition of the uh, uh, lipids to the, to, the, to the protein, which is sitting in the membrane. And it's thought to stabilize the uh, spike protein in the membrane. And so we assembled the model. We, we uh, used the ER-like membrane because uh, the, the coronavirus buds into the ERGIC or into the ER. Uh, and uh, first thing that we, we noticed was that this whole assembled model was uh, sort of having a very clear uh, bending uh, uh, or hinges. And we, we thought that we could coin this, those names for, for them. So the hip and knee and ankle, which would be then easier to, to follow what, what is what. And uh, to increase the, the, our chances of catching some interesting movement or, of, the, of the spike, we multiplied it uh, four times. Uh, when we added a model, model of water and IOs into it, we created this kind of a simulation box. And then uh, what can we do with that? So, so there is a technique which I'm using is a molecular dynamic simulations and uh, it uses the uh, physics-based uh, potentials between the, between the atoms. So if you imagine this is your simulation box, you have atoms inside. We know from other experiments uh, what kind of interactions are between the, between the atoms, what is the strength of different bonds and so on. So we can define a potential energy between them. And this is so-called a uh, force field. From the force field, one can calculate the potential energy of the system. From the potential energy, one can calculate the forces acting on every and each atom. From that, we can use the second Newton law to calculate the accelerations. And we can predict the velocities and the positions of the system at the next time step, which is usually uh, after two femtoseconds. This is a typical slicing of our, of our uh, time. Uh, also, we use the periodic uh, images, meaning that the, if the particle uh, leads the box from one side, it will enter from the other. Because of that, we, can, we, can, we are sort of pretending we are in the infinite uh, system. And by repeating this, this procedure, uh, we can accumulate the snapshots from the, from the simulation, and this is called a trajectory. And in, in our case, uh, we can reach uh, microsecond uh, timescales. So what it looks like uh, when you would uh, plug it together and we have our model of, of four spikes, and we, can, we can actually uh, sort of play it and see uh, how the spikes are moving in the, in, 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 uh, in the membrane. And as you can see, it uh, doesn't sample too much of a diffusional motion because this is a much slower process, but it can sample quite a bit of the glycan mobility and the mobility of the, of the legs in the, in the joints. And this was the moment where we actually teamed up with uh, Martin Beck's uh, group and we looked at their first uh, images and it was very striking to us that they saw, they saw very similar uh, joints as Beata mentioned uh, in the spike proteins which were very nicely corresponding to the sizes that we, we saw in the simulation. So to sort of focus on that, we uh, looked through our uh, snapshots from our trajectories. We would like fix one part of the, of the protein and then look what the other parts would, would be doing. And if you would focus on the head of the spike, you will see this kind of uh, umbrella of, of structures and then uh, you could go through different joints and see how, how much it's, it spans. And we could quantify it and uh, if you, we define the angles between those joints uh, at the ankle, knee and hip. 
we see that all of them are actually spanning quite a bit, so they go up to 60 degrees, uh, meaning that this is very, indeed very uh, flexible. And uh, to make sure that this is fitting the, the, the actual data, uh, we took the uh, a number of, uh, of row tomograms, and uh, by just selecting the frames from the trajectory, we could uh, fit the uh, structures into those tomograms, which, which was very uh, striking because typically uh, the resolution doesn't allow for that to just go through the raw data and put the structures in. And uh, then we, we tried to do some uh, density guided simulations and uh, as expected the head, uh, because it's resolved much better, was fitting uh, very well, but the, the structure of the, of the leg remained uh, elusive. But by selecting the, the uh, uh, structures with different uh, bending uh, angles, we could actually recapitulate the, the classes and we could explain why uh, some of them are well, like so, sort of resolved in the in the leg region, and some of them are levitating, and in some the membrane is lost. And it was, it became clear that it was uh, bec only because of the this distance of the of the head uh, from the membrane because of the mobility of the of the joints. So the more uh, the joint is bent, the the sort of shorter the, the leg, and then the little bit better resolution of the of the of it. And we can also explain why the uh, those uh, densities are sort of levitating because uh, of the extreme mobility of the of the of the lower leg. So if you focus on the uh, uh, spike protein and you uh, ask what what uh, how the rest of the structure is moving, and from that you can actually calculate the electron density, you arrive at something like that, which is comparable to one of these uh, these classes here. And uh, so we went further to analyze the the, uh, the trajectories. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we covered the, the spikes with the with the physiological amount of uh, glycans. And here we calculated the density of the glycans uh, with different contouring levels. And you can see that these glycans are extremely mobile and they cover like the, really the most of the structure. There are very few spots which are sticking out, in, including the RBDs, which is the the Logically, it makes sense that the, the uh, spike protein wants to have some sort of a interface for interaction with the AC2. And uh, to check uh, how the glycan pattern is fitting to the uh, actual density, we, we aligned this, this kind of uh, glycan densities together with the density coming from the, from the experiment. And we noticed that those uh, bulges which were visible in the experiment are very nicely filled with the uh, with two minutes. Yes, with the glycan densities. Some of the glycans were branching, uh, which is also kind of a spectacular feature. Usually it's not visible in the, in the maps. And with that, we could resolve uh, the leg because knowing how the leg is bending, we could select the, the, some structures in which the, the leg was the least bent. And we could see that the glycans were also present on the, on the leg, which, is, which was the first time that one could see it. And this is how this looks like when you, when you calculate the density from the a simulation which is very uh, comparable. And a little bit of outlook, how we think why these legs are uh, uh, important, why the mobility of legs is important, is that uh, it's, the virus is relatively round and uh, small compared to the cell. So it, it might be beneficial for the ability of the virus to actually be able to capture more than one AC2 uh, receptor. And by having uh, those legs on the, on the flexible joint, it can uh, adjust to the uh, shape of the cell and uh, have interactions with more than one receptors and uh, maybe this increases the chance of the virus to actually enter the cell. Uh, so this is the, the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 doesn't consist only of the spike, there is uh, much more in it as we saw in this uh, cartoon. So the, the, uh, all the data, uh, the raw data actually we made available in the NPR on this, under this NPR number. and. Uh, some examples is, for instance, the M protein, which uh, we believe is, is visible in the in the membranes, or the N protein, which uh, I mean, it's hard to say, but sometimes there are those solenoid-like structures which are uh, quite striking in the in the interior of the of the virus. So all these things are waiting for the discovery. Also, knowing the the structure, we can uh, predict uh, the, for instance, the epitopes for the neutralizing antibodies, and we could do some guided uh, development of the antibodies. And this we, we actually tried already, and this is on this bioarchive uh, uh, preprint. Uh, and this is like a, how to apply this in, in context knowledge of the, of the spike protein. 
and lastly, because of the extremely high quality of the data, this is I think one of the very first one of the few cases where when work, where one could use the raw uh, uh, tomograms, segment the membrane, put back the lipids, put back the uh, spikes protein, and then have a one-to-one -one, uh, theoretical model of the of the virus, which then we can simulate. We can we can try to do things with it. So I think this is also quite remarkable. And with that, I would like to thank uh, all the people involved in this in this study, and uh, especially Gerhard Hummer, Martin Beck, and Jakomine, and all the funding uh, bodies which were involved. And thank you very much. Fantastic work, uh, Beata and Mateus, um, for opening up to uh, to questions. So there were, so, in the meantime, two questions, sorry, there were two questions already asked um, yeah. in the chat. Uh, one was, uh, what is our measure for improved substructure sub during the averaging? So um, we uh, typically measure the resolution of, of the structure. And if, uh, if it's at certain point, it stops improving no matter of uh, what parameters do we use. And this is a typical good hint that we cannot go any further. Um, and the other question was that uh, if the fixation with paraformaldehyde could uh, could uh, compromise the structure and uh, short answer is no, because uh, we use only 4% that really preserve the structure as it is. It doesn't uh, exercise any, any pressure on the structure in it. Of course, with more concentration, this could be different, but this is specially developed or uh, empirically known uh, concentration for cryo-electron tomography and microscopy that it preserves the state as it really is. So, so I have a question that may be a little strange, but is it possible to, uh, to sort of generate a decoy that would uh, sort of saturate by stoichiometry the, vi the viral ability to then bind to the ACE2 receptor based on the structure of the proteins that you have elucidated? I think it's an interesting uh, point, and uh, but this is sort of a uh, thing that would uh, involve the neutralizing antibodies, right? So you would adjust to the uh, surface of, of the protein which is involved in the binding. You would have uh, enough antibodies there to uh, block it from from binding. And uh, but I think there is also a field for uh, maybe some small drugs which could be used to to uh, block the the, the binding. Uh, but I think it's more about the, the single particle uh, structures with the highest resolution, which could be helpful here and uh, uh, look where, where one could look into the specific uh, binding sites. Yep. Thank you, Beata and Mateus. Uh, seeing no other questions, we can move on to the next presentation. Uh, Andy, uh, Andrea, if, if yeah. I could ask a quick question. Um, Absolutely. In the tomography, Tomography, you, you said that most of the viral particles, most of the, the S protein was in the, the pre-fusion state. Um, did you also see post-fusion structures? And if so, did you have enough of those to, to sort out whether they also showed this um, flexibility in what you're defining as the, the hip and ankle? Uh, we didn't, uh, we, I could saw like three, four in total. In on uh, this 1,900 environment, so this will be not enough to. They were all straight. Uh, um, got it. But not enough to really do any any averaging on those. It's possible that there are more, so it's uh, also hard because um, um, it's also hard to really go over all 1,100. It was done more <laughs> in an automatic way. Um, so there might be a bit more than four, <laughs> but definitely not enough to to produce um, nice nice average that will be more revealing. 